Let's give glory and praise to God for this beautiful day. Zion, we are so, so blessed to have gifted people and gifted servants as we do. I mean, they're just absolutely incredible. And um, from those that are in the booth, um, manning what's on the screen here, to the sound people, to the men's choir, the praise dancers, band, ushers, everybody. Let's just praise and honor God for these gifts. Now, can we do that? Come on, I think you can do better than that. Yeah, just... Uh, Incredible, incredible blessing to me. As I watch the dancers, I, I just wanted to fly away. And I told the band this morning, y'all keep sounding like that, and I won't preach today. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's get into the word, how to soar. How to soar. And... Let's start with Isaiah 40 and 28. Isaiah 40 and 28. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God? The creator of the ends of the earth does not faint or grow weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint and weary, and to him who has no might, he increases strength, causing it to multiply and making it to abound. Even youths shall faint and be weary. Even what? Youths, if you can circle that in your Bible, even the youths and young men shall feebly stumble and fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord, who expect, look for, and hope in him. Those who do what? Those who do what? Wait on the Lord. And then what? Shall change and renew their strength and power. They shall lift their wings and mount up close to God. They shall lift their wings and mount up what? If you take close to God out of this particular verse, it changes everything. But when you insert close to God, it gives it new meaning, right? They shall mount their wings up what? That's our aim here is to... Be closer to God. Now, as eagles mount up to the sun, they shall what? And they shall walk and not faint. Okay, stay with me here. Wednesday was another 
interesting time. One for the records. Wednesday night, we started off sharing with the Bible study group a piece that was written by Sadell Bradley, one of our minister friends, daughters, um, who wrote in regards to the silence of many leaders as it relates to the turmoil that's going on in the nation. And she likened it to a game that they used to play in the South called crickets. If you remember, I shared with you on last week um, before I began to teach, our study was interrupted by the sound of crickets. One would think that we're reading from a, a manual or something, but it's, we're not. It's just one spirit. And I pray that the spirit of the Lord speaks to us today. Amen. Now, if that wasn't enough, as I was given my very last word to the class, there was a clap of lightning. Donald, who sings in the male choir, said on yesterday evening, Pastor, it sounded like it was right at the door. Nothing gets your attention like lightning. It got our attention. And um, there was no lingering around that night. Uh, <laughs> People ran for the door, first of all, to see if it was raining, where the cloud was, how quick they could get to their vehicles and then home. And I got to thinking about the lightning and its meaning in a prophetic sense, just as I thought about the crickets. Lightning means in the prophetic sense, power, supernatural arm. It indicates that the voice of God is speaking and interrupting the activity of man. Something is happening and it's happening quickly. So, God was divinely interrupting our day, our night to get our attention as he was interrupting, if you will, in the time of Isaiah to get his attention. God who controls the cosmic forces was speaking to Isaiah in a very stormy period of the land of Judah. I said on yesterday evening, it seems as though dark clouds had descended upon that land because their king, Uzziah, had passed away. At the passing of a leader, I've experienced that things can change radically. They can remain the same, but oh, they can change greatly. They can change for the better or they can change for the worse. How will there be a change? What change will come about in the land of Judah at the death of King Uzziah? At his departure, will there be a felt void in the land? Will there be this vacuum of leadership? What will the people do? 
What do you do when someone close, someone that you depended on, is taken from this life? Is there a void in you? Do you cease to hope and trust in God? I think that whole situation brings our attention in for various reasons. And so let's first of all look at Uzziah. Let's see what kind of person he was, what kind of king he was, what kind of impact did he leave while living that would determine the response of the people. Uh, there's some background of him in Second Chronicles chapter 26. And while they're pulling it up on the board, I will begin to tell you about him. He ascended to the throne as a boy king at the age of 16. He reigned for 52 years. Verse 5 says a lot about him. And I pray that verse 5 stays with you when you leave the sanctuary, when you get in your car and you go home. I pray that it stays with you for the rest of your life. It says of Isaiah, as long as he sought, inquired of, yearned for the Lord, God made him prosper. As long as he sought, inquired of, yearned for the Lord, God made him prosper. If we could take that Isaiah 40 passage and insert it there, as long as he waited for the Lord, as long as he had confidence, as long as he placed his expectations in God, God made him prosper. A synonym for prosper, we want to use here, would be to fly. He was soaring high as long as what? Are y'all here? Okay. As long as he did what? As long as he inquired of the Lord, he was able to soar. He was able to fly high. So then, Pastor what did he do? Um, let me highlight some things that he did. He was able to build towers in the desert. He dug wells in the desert, which is a major thing. And the place where ships would come in for commercialism, uh, it was obviously torn down. Well, Uzziah rebuilt that. And so kings like Jehoshaphat uh, and Hezekiah soon will be able to utilize that for commercialism. Uh, he dared to fight the Philistines. One, <laughs> tore down walls built inside of the city. He built up uh, military strength. He was innovative. He was an inventor. He created military, well, state-of-the-art military weapons for his army. Um, he became very strong, and his fame spread abar abroad. Verse 15, let's look at it. In Jerusalem, he made Machines invented by skillful men to be on the towers and the corner 
uh, the latter part of that is, and his fame spread far, for he was marvelously helped. He was marvelously helped till he was strong. Then there's a transition. Verse 16. But when King Uzziah was strong, he became proud. He became proud to his destruction. Now, here I want to go back to the outline that I gave to you on last week. And we said in order to soar, the first thing you have to do, let me see if you can remember. The first thing you have to do is what? Very good. And shout it out. You have to do what? You have to see God high and lift it up. And the second thing you must do is what? Speak to God. Tell him where you are. Be honest with God. And then the third thing is what? Yeah. And I felt that the Holy Spirit wanted to detail this out. I did not know how, but we're now going to take that same outline and the Spirit begins to speak to us as we observe the life of Uzziah. But when King Uzziah was strong, well, first of all, let me say this. Can you thank God that your strength comes from him right now? When he was strong, he became proud. My brother George shouted out something yesterday in the service that just blew me away. In the New King James Version, it says, but when he was strong, his Heart was lifted up. Isn't that amazing? We said in order to soar, you got to see God lifted up. Now, when you forget who's your strength, when, when you forget who gives you the power and the mind to get wealth. That's when your heart is open to Satan and your heart is lifted up. And we said this, Raymond, what's in your heart will determine the heights that you ascend to in life. What's in your heart will determine the heights that you will ascend in life. He became proud and lifted up in his heart. What happens after that? Let's go to verse 16 again. He trespassed against God. He did what? What does trespass mean? He broke the law. Yeah. He, he knew what was right, but for his own selfish gain, he went against what he knew to be right. Some of your Bibles would say that he transgressed, which means to break away. Uh, a willful deviation 
from godly living is what that means. He transgressed or he trespassed. Uh, either one will work. But it wasn't just to the laws of the land. It was against God. What did he do that was so horrible, Pastor? For he went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Now let's look at this. What is the purpose? What would be the purpose of incense? To ascend, to soar up to God. But here's the problem. He trespassed. He moved in, as we said, it's dangerous to move in a place illegally when God has not sent you there. Are you listening to me? For he went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. And Azariah, the priest, went in after him, accompanied by a posse of 80 men, which tells us that they were kind of afraid of King Uzziah. They opposed him, verse 18, and said to him, Lord, this is not for you. This is not for you. Have you ever been in a place trying to move into an arena and God basically said to you, you know what? This is, this is not for you. This, this is not your lane. I did not sanction you to be here. They opposed the king, said, this is not for you. It's not for you, Isaiah, to burn incense to the Lord. It's for who? It's for the priests. This is for the sons of Aaron who have been set apart. They've been, <laughs> they've been consecrated to do this. Listen, it doesn't matter how well you may study up on a particular area. If God has not anointed you and chosen you or appointed you to be in that place, you may be in a very precarious, dangerous situation. Look at your neighbor and say, stay in your lane. <laughs> this is not for you, King Isaiah. So, Lord have mercy, withdraw from the sanctuary. Surrender from the sanctuary. You have trespassed. You are moving in an illegal fashion. And that will not be to your credit. How does brother respond? Nineteen. Then Uzziah was enraged. Had a censer in hand. Um, he's going off. 
I mean, he's really clocking. Do you know who I am? Then, if you will, a clap of lightning. God was trying to get his attention. That clap of lightning and appeared, what appeared on his forehead was scales, leprosy, where he not only had to be ushered out, he knew that God struck him. As you read further on down there, it's, it's, a, sad, it's a sad commentary on his life. He lived out the rest of his days as a leper. And rather than being buried in the king's cemetery, he had to be buried outside of the king's cemetery because he was a leper. Listen. In order to soar, you got to see God high and lifted up and make sure you're not lifted up in yourself. Make sure that you're getting your instructions from the Lord. I'm going to tell you this. I got this this morning. It's a blessing to soar. It really is. But what goes up got to come down. And when you come down, you don't want to be so broke down that you can't get around. The truth of the matter is, you're going to spend more time walking than you will soaring. So there has to be a balance where you learn also and you're thankful for the fact that you can walk. Amen. Amen. Let me share something with you on yesterday. I had two baby blessings. And the first one, um, a little boy, 10 years old, said to me, I mean, looked me straight in the eye, never met me before, said, do you have something cold to drink? <laughs> I said, you know what? I, I love the fact that you are so bold and, and bright and you look me straight in the eye, I said, I don't have anything in here, but let's walk over to McDonald's. So he was excited, and his other two brothers, who were nine and eight, joined us as we were walking over to McDonald's. They saw the little path. We can cut through there. As we were walking through, they said, how old are you? <laughs> well. The oldest brother said, you're not supposed to ask a person that. And I said, well, guess. One said, 30. <laughs> I said, higher. The other said, 40, higher, 60. I said, I'm 59. Then they said, oh, you're in your middle ages. <laughs> and Brian, I thought, I'm glad I'm not in my dark ages. <laughs> went on with are you a bishop or are you a pastor <laughs> oh god <laughs> uh, uh, all these questions <laughs> um, I like to be called pastor and here it comes 
Do you know how to scream? <laughs> Can you say hallelujah? <laughs> But you know, Brother Jones, it was all a setup by God. I'm walking. I'm walking with these little guys. And it hit me. Said, God has blessed you to soar. But be thankful now in your middle ages. <laughs> that you have the ability to walk. And if I need to, I can still run. <laughs> and the role now, doctor, for me and for many of us is to teach the young eaglets how to soar. But you have to be thankful, you see, in your heart for where you are, where God has placed you so you can hear him for the next. My heart mourns because there are so many young men and girls who want to know how to soar, but they have nobody to teach them. God wants to get your attention. Will you be one of uh, to teach them as you get close to God, to teach them how to get close to God. Can we thank God for truth right here? Okay. Let's go back to the Isaiah passage and tell you just one other thing. And we'll close. Are y'all all right? Hmm. So was there a vacuum of leadership um, when Isaiah died? Absolutely no. In chapter 1, God spells out the fact that he's been their father. Chapter 5, he spells out the fact that he has been there helping them to receive everything that they had in an economic sense. He's been keeping them, and though the king is gone, he is the king above all kings. Lightning strikes at the door of America right now because we're wondering what's going to happen. Where are we now? And God says, no matter what, I'm in control. Amen. Hallelujah. Hang on a second. Hang, hang on a second. So be comforted in your spirit right now. Be be encouraged in your spirit right now that God is on the throne and he reigns with all power in his hands. Now let's all together shout and celebrate God. Come on, you can do better than that. You can do much better than that.
In the time of storm, Isaiah was comforted. And he helped the people through a very difficult time of 70 years of captivity. When they come out, it was where we are right now. When they come out of it and they're wondering what we will do. He says this, what God says to him. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to the heart of Jerusalem and cry out to him, to her that her time of warfare is over. Her iniquity is pardoned. I struggled with this verse, and then God made it clear. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. Jesus, what does that mean? Just stay with me for a few minutes. Can I help you to view this from an agricultural sense? Can you go in your mind with me at least to my own personal garden? Was plowed up this year where I planted seeds, if you will, of collards, peas, shoots of tomatoes, other vegetables. And now it's grown up. And the point that I'm making here is that God will always give you more than what you have sown. Your harvest will always be greater than the seeds that you put in the ground. I'm going to give you a minute to catch that. Let me paint the picture further for you. A week ago, my sisters, Linda and Blanche, came over because they realized that I could not pick all the harvest by myself. They came back again on Friday, again with bags and baskets. And as I looked at the baskets, I discovered they were running over. Amen. When you put a seed in the ground, God will always give you more than what you have planted. Amen. Amen. Now let's spiritualize that. Can you dare to view the garden where you planted spiritual seeds and look at how God has blessed you. You've received more than what you put in. And if you can see that, then let's take time. Just take a moment and thank God. I'm almost done. And just thank God for the overflow. Well, Linda, we see how it works in an agricultural sense. We see how it works in an agricultural sense, and we know how it works in the spiritual sense. When we sow seeds of obedience, God will then open up the windows of heaven, and there are blessings that we don't have room enough to receive. But now... This is what you got to look at. Does he do the same thing? Does the same principle of multiplication happen when you sow seeds 
of disobedience? I want you to think about this. If you sow in disobedience and harvest it in terms of the multiplication of God, as a result of what you sowed, you couldn't take it. You would be completely destroyed. The penalty would be too great. The punishment too great. So this is what happens. When you sow in disobedience, God looks. And there's an intervention between the sowing and the reaping. Something, something happens. Uh, you're not getting it. Let me put it to you this way. God loves, God chastens who he loves. You know that scripture? Okay. And so will a parent chasten. Yeah, I see your mouth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> chastens. Yeah, those they love. And in the chastening, sometimes, sometimes, mama will have it and she'll say, you know what, I brought you into this world and I'll take you out. But then something happens in the course of her wanting to take you out in her mind. There's an intervention. Thank you, Jesus. Love compels her not to kill you, not to destroy you. It's the same hallelujah with the love of God. In his wrath, we would be destroyed. But look at Lamentations. 3 and 22, if you will. It says, by his mercies and loving kindness, it's because of the Lord's mercy and grace that we are not destroyed. Because his tender compassions fail not. That is a hallelujah moment, y'all. It's a hallelujah moment. And not only that, not only that, <laughs> because you don't make just one mistake. They are new. I'll let you complete the message. They are new when? Every morning. So day by day as you mess up, his grace and mercy are following you, picking up after you, keeping you, intervening for you. So even in the place of disobedience, he's given you double for your sins, which is his mercy and his grace. Everybody stand and give God praise. I'm done. You want to soar, see God lifted up as a loving God, a merciful God, yes, a gracious, comforting, forgiving God. Speak to him. Tell him. Tell him where you are. Don't fight against him. Surrender, surrender, surrender to him. My prayer for this nation is that we see God high 
and lift it up. There's a lot of folks lifted up in their hearts right now. We got to see God lift it up. Is there pain in your heart? Speak to him now and where you are. Surrender to him and he's going to give you the lift that you need. He will show you exactly where he wants you to be at this time. Would you join me at the altar? Let's go to God in, in prayer for one another, for our nation. Let's, let's just gather around here.